Well, welcome everyone to this first workshop of Coastal Connections. It's our pleasure to see you all here. And uh, we're going to be looking at this topic today, which is understanding the significance of coastal heritage. And I'm really delighted to say that Coastal Connections, which has been started as a joint initiative, a joint project, both with English Heritage and with World Monuments Fund, is launching this series of workshops. And this is the, the first one of those. World Monuments Fund, one of the leading organisations in safeguarding the replaceable and mitigating against climate change, and English Heritage as the nation's supervisor and honouring the, uh, the heritage of English heritage for about 400 sites across England. So I'm very pleased to, to welcome you all. And we have a really nice range of participants today, uh, those that are actively involved in managing coastal heritage sites, and those that are also keen to explore different perspectives, those that are um, observers. And effectively, what we want to do with the whole idea of Coastal Connections, to bring people together, to explore those different perspectives, and to find some solutions, to share those solutions together, practical solutions that obviously mean so much for more mitigating against the effects of and impacts of climate change. So I'm really, really pleased that we've got so many of you with us today. That's fantastic. I'm now going to just pass over to Rob Woodside, the Estates Director at English Heritage, to explain and to uh, talk a little bit about this partnership that we've got with World Monuments Fund and English Heritage. So, Rob, over to you. Thanks, Alex. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Great. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, um, back in 2021, uh, we lost about 40 metres of the east wing of Hearst Castle. Um, and this is one of our properties on the south coast of England. And that was a, a, pro, a, a process led by both coastal retreat and the impact of two particularly uh, strong winter storms, much like we're having at the moment. Um, my colleague Roy Porter is going to speak a little bit later about why Hearst Castle matters and the actions we've taken to hold the line, at least for now. But when I was faced with the challenge of, of Hearst Castle, um, and I recognise that uh, we're not the only organisation facing this sort of challenge. So I nominated her to the 2022 uh, World Monument Watch, uh, which is managed by the World Monuments Fund, um, to try and find a way of, of, of raising the profile of this property, but also thinking about how we could uh, learn from its experience and share it with other uh, heritage professionals around the world. So I'm delighted that the, the idea of a, a virtual global classroom, um, as I called it at the time, has actually now taken root. And here we are today uh, at the beginning of a new program of discussions, talks, knowledge exchange and information gathering, which I hope will lead to the creation of a new online resources for heritage practitioners and communities and potentially creating new partnerships between all of us to help uh, support ourselves with this challenge. Um, I'm also really delighted that the Coastal Connections is a key pillar of the new World Monuments Fund Coastal Heritage Initiative, which was la launched last week. Um, but I want to make the point that what we're dealing with here is not just about climate change. C coastal properties are already highly dynamic, highly complex, um, and facing a whole different range of factors. And that might be human induced, it may be down to poor planning, it may be down to um, infrastructure and, and urban development, it could be down to competing designations, um, different authorities managing sites or the landscape around them. And inevitably we're all facing issues around um, potential lack of funding, lack of political will and support. So we need to be able to make the case very clearly about what we're trying to achieve here, why these places matter, and, and how we can work together to, to learn and share all these different complexities around coastal heritage, which are only actually really being accelerated by uh, climate change. Um, so um, that's why today, the beginning of this programme, we need to start asking our questions about the asking ourselves the question about why do these places matter? Who to, why, and for what reason? Because if we as heritage pr practitioners and others can't answer that, who will? And we'll never otherwise be able to make the case. So I'll pass over to John. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, and just to, to introduce myself, I'm John Darlington, I'm the Director of Projects for World Monuments Fund. And as Rob said, uh, understanding significance 
why we value places is uh, key actually to their conservation. And before we get into the detail of that, I'm just going to frame this, the main theme of today's workshop by asking why, why are we talking about significance? And the answer is simple, really, is that uh, the reason that we're talking about significance is it because it's the best place to begin a conversation about change. Significance tells us what is valued by who and why. And in a changing world, uh, particularly one where heritage is impacted by climate change, particularly one in a coastal context, which is obviously uh, our main topic, uh, the, the idea of why a building, a landscape or tradition is considered important is critical because it helps guide us in the future management of change. The next speakers are going to talk about significance either in the context of their own sites or in their areas of expertise. But before handing over to them, I wanted to remind us all that when we talk about significance, we have choices. Uh, what people value changes. It changes depending on the context in which we live, the culture in which we live, the technology which we have available to us, when we live and where we live. Uh, a few examples of that, just to give you an idea of this kind of fluidity of significance and value. So in my first picture, you'll see the 19th century excavators of Girsu in southern Iraq. Now, Girsu is one of the earliest uh, city-states in the world. It dates from way back to 5000 BCE, but its main kind of heyday was around 3000 BCE. And the excavators, the 19th century excavators of this site, effectively were seeking the cuneiform, they were seeking the ziggurats, they were seeking the palace of the people of Girsu. And in seeking it, they completely ignored all the, all the later stuff which then accumulated on top of the Sumerian uh, early city-state. And effectively, they destroyed a Hellenistic era palace, which they then reconstructed or reused as part of their, their excavator's uh, hut complex. The story of the passing over of more recent past, because it's unrecognized or not valued, is repeated throughout history, digging through the Dark Ages in the scramble for Roman uh, uh, heritage, industrial heritage ignored over the medieval, even the 20th century architecture, which swept away because it's considered not proper history. So all these things are repeated and then remedied, and few of us would adopt such an approach today. Another example is that uh, geography and culture play a part. Heritage value is rel uh, relative, so what is common and taken for granted in one country may be rare and idolized in another. There are thousands of timber frame buildings, for example, in Europe that date from the mid 17th century or earlier. In the United States, Fairbanks House in Massachusetts is the earliest surviving example, and that dates to 1637. Legislation reflects this as an in, as, and is an indicator too. So in the UK, a building might be listable after 10 years. It's very rare, mainly 30 years is the kind of earliest date. In India, that dates back to 50 years ago. In Pakistan, it's to 1857. In Sri Lanka, it's even earlier. So where legislation provides a benchmark for protection, that, that, that also differs. And finally, the 21st century, like others before it, have brought with it challenges to the old narratives. There is now an expectation to see the story, for example, downstairs, as well as upstairs at National Trust mansions in the UK. And preservation is much about the sites that tell the, the stories of working people, as it is for the stories of the ruling elites. There is increasing recognition of the need to champion underrepresented stories, be they on behalf of women, LGBTQ, uh, or indigenous peoples who have different understandings and different knowledge. And as is the recognition that heritage is not just about architecture and archaeology, but includes an intangible world of dance, music, accent, festival, tradition, which is cherished by millions. So the concept of heritage today now covers everything, go to my last two pictures, uh, from disappearing languages to cultural landscapes and food, through the protection of seabed wrecks, Paul McCartney's childhood home, and of course, the archaeology of the moon. 
Our perception and definitions of the past therefore shapes our legacy. We will put energy into what we value and tend to ignore those things that we do not value. My point, one that I'm sure will be illustrated by the uh, next speaker, is that when we define and seek to understand significance, we make choices. So what are those choices? Lovely, thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, it's good to have that framing of the discussion. What we'll be doing is having a time that we'll listen to five speakers and then we'll have time for a brief Q&A from that. And then we'll move into a discussion which then John will, uh, will lead into for us. So without further ado then, I'd like to uh, ask Roy Porter to, uh, to, to join us online. <laughs> Here he is. Uh, just to tell you, he's the Senior Properties Curator of English Heritage in the southeast of England. He's involved with the conservation management of several coastal historic properties. And today, he's going to talk about the one which has given him the most cause for thought in recent years. So over to you, Roy. Thank you very much, Alex. And hello to everybody um, who's uh, joining us today. Um, yeah, Hearst Castle um, has exercised my mind a, a lot recently, and the, I think the collective mind of English heritage for the last uh, two or three years, because it um, really presents the the most critical existential um, case study, really, for us as, 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 a, as a coastal location. It really is the site which is up against it the most. Um, fortunately, today, I have the luxury of not having to talk about its vulnerability. I've been asked to, to say a few words instead of about its significance, and why it matters. And what I want to do over the next eight minutes in quite a gallop is, is really give a, a sense of, of its significance to show you why we think it's exceptionally important because of the, the evidence contained in its fabric, the, the national stories it reflects, and its landscape value. In other words, Hearst Castle is, is a prism through which important aspects of British history are revealed and can be explored, and it contributes massively to the sense of place of its location. So if we go to the next slide, we can start um, with its location. And for those of you who don't know uh, Hearst Castle, there it is from the air. It's located at the end of a shingle spit, which projects about a mile into the Solent, the stretch of water which separates the um, Isle of Wight from mainland England. And this is an incredibly important stretch of water, strategically speaking, uh, throughout sort of modern history, um, of uh, the United Kingdom. There was a perpetual fear that people who were trying to invade would land on the Isle of Wight, and the shingle spit afforded um, a, a, a commanding position for a castle first constructed uh, in the 1540s. And if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, that castle of the 1540s. Right at the centre, the nucleus of our site, is of artillery fortification constructed for King Henry VIII, um, and in terms of national stories, of course, for any of you who know about Henry VIII, you will know that this national crisis uh, was um, the result of his uh, marital and religious policies and the fact that he was concerned that there would be a, a joint Franco-Spanish invasion in the 1540s. And it promoted the king into establishing what at that stage was the largest national program of, of defence in this country's history. And Hearst Castle exemplifies fortifications of the 1540s. Um, when you look at the plan of it, um, it's symmetrical. When you look at the form of it with its rounded parapets, it really speaks to us of the 1540s. If we go to the next slide, um, you will see that not only is it, um, is its external form, um, in fact, let's go to the, the slide after this because I'm probably behind time already. There we go. Look, at, it's not just its external form, it's also its internal form which uh, speaks to us of the 16th century. And I want to point out that, that you know, the, the interior has never been subject to any detailed archaeological analysis. So one of the things which you know I'm always very much aware of when I visit Hearst Castle is the fact that um, there are traces of the history of the garrison life in the walls all around me as I walk around, be it in the extant features, be it in the, um, the, the scars and traces of lost features, uh, be it within buried archaeological features um, as well. So there we can see some images of the 16th century. If we go to the next slide, Long, what you can also see from the interior is that there's been lots of changes. And this is one of the sort of leitmotifs of Hearst Castle. 
changes at times of national emergency. And the photographs I've chosen here are photographs which display um, quite radical changes made to the Tudor building in the very early 19th century, uh, when the United Kingdom was at war with Napoleonic France. The Tudor castle was overhauled, and its defences were adapted to suit the, the contemporary needs of artillery defence. So the top left-hand slide there, you can see um, that the, the, the roof of the Tudor castle has been repurposed to take heavy guns of the early 19th century, and you can see a magazine in the basement of the Tudor castle, uh, bottom left. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll discover that around 60 years later, a very similar situation obtained. There was another period of what I can only describe as national paranoia. This time, uh, the British were convinced that the France of Emperor Napoleon III was a potential hostile uh, country, and there was an expectation and anticipation of another uh, invasion. And I said that the 16th century set of works was the largest in the country's history up to that date. Well, this, the set of works put in train by the 1859 Royal Commission were the largest this country has ever seen. And they included the construction of two huge casemated wings either side of the Tudor castle, which you can see um, in this slide. If we go to the next one, next slide along, we'll see what the casemated wings are. May have lost you there, Roy. I don't know if you can hear us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think in that case, sorry, Roy, I think we'll have to leave it there and move straight on to Stephanie. Okay, let's move straight on to you then, Stephanie. So, Stephanie, just to introduce you a little bit there, Stephanie Ortiz, Regional Director of World Monuments Fund for Latin. America and the Caribbean, and you oversee WMF's conservation field projects, of course, in those areas. Some of your projects include post-disaster recovery projects in Mexico and Puerto Rico, the coordination of international conferences and workshops in Guatemala and Cuba, and advocacy campaigns through the World Monuments Watch. We're delighted to have you with us and talking about a very, very different site. So looking at Rappi Nui here, that uh, very familiar image. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for the invitation. Hi, everyone. Um, so we'll get started. I'm I'm excited to, to share with you all a bit, just a teeny tiny bit about the captivating heritage of Rapa Nui. Um, the, this island in the Pacific Ocean is a special territory of Chile and, and the ancient home of the Polynesian Rapa Nui people who settled there about a thousand years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So just to put it into context, Rapa Nui is, is quite small. It is smaller than, say, Barbados in the Caribbean or St. Kitts and Nevis, um, roughly the same size, slightly larger than Staten Island in, in New York. Um, the entirety of the island is designated as a national monument by the Chilean government. And the, the Rapa Nui National Park, which is also a World Heritage Site, covers about 40% of the island. The park itself features nearly 20,000 archeological sites, representing a culture that developed largely or essentially untouched by external influences until the first European contact in the 18th century. Uh, today, I'll only show four of the iconic heritage, and I've circled them in the map. I circled three, but one of them contains two sites. Uh, and I'll reflect a little bit on, on their significance or the different layers of significance. Uh, Rapa Nui uh, is, is best known for, for the colossal statues, the, the Moai that are hand carved from volcanic rock. Over a thousand Moai are scattered across the island uh, with more than 400 ahu. The ahus are the, the ceremonial platforms where we see the moais often they're perched on top of these, these platforms. Um, the ahu, many of them also served as tombs. The moai are largely concentrated, and the ahu in particular, they're largely concentrated along the coast. Um, the moai represent the ancestors or deified, um, yeah, deified 
chiefs of the clans that are protecting the island by looking inward. They're, look, they're looking at the Rapanui people. Next slide, please. Thank you. They're, the coastal location for these sites, it's, it makes them very, it's highly significant, but also exposes them precariously to increasing sea levels and severe weather events. Um, I have a few sites here um, on the top. You'll see Anakena. Anakena represents where the first settler, King Hotumatua, disembarked in the island. It is also uh, the, the only sandy beach in all of Rapa Nui. Um, and it also features the oldest known Moai. The Ahu at Uranga, Ura Uranga de Mahina, uh, which is perched about 10 feet above the rocky coast. And that's the, the two pictures on the bottom right. Um, in, 2017, in 2017, it faced severe danger when parts of its supporting walls, supporting wall collapsed after being battered by huge waves. Uh, whereas the nearby Ahu Akahanga, which is also, you can see it's in the eroding coastline, According to local tradition, this is where King Hotumatua is buried. And so along the coastline, there are also caves, remains of dwelling, dwellings, rock guard, all constantly exposed to the elements. They face increasing threats of coastal erosions, uh, tidal swells, and tsunamis. And I should note, and because you see them here in the in, in some of the photographs, that the moai shown on the ground here were not toppled by the waves or by erosion. Between the 17 and these particular sites, the, between the 17th and the 18th century, internal conflicts among the clans uh, led to the eventual toppling of all of the moai in the island. And while there was a large effort to restore the moai to their standing position in the 20th, 20th century, eventually uh, toward the later part of the, uh, the that century, um, there's a shift to prioritize conservation over restoration. Next slide. So this takes us to uh, the ceremonial village of Orongo, where the Tangata Manu ritual became the focal point of the Rapa Nui culture during this period of conflict that I mentioned. Every spring, the clans would gather at Orongo to compete to retrieve the first egg laid by the Manu Tara, which is a, a migratory seabird, a, a tern, I think it's the, is the name. Um, from each clan would descend the cliff, swim to Motunui. Motunui, you see three islets in the it's in the picture to the left. Motunui is the farther one, the bigger one. Um, to retrieve the first egg, swim back, climb, and hand the egg over to the chief, and then that clan, that chief, would essentially rule over the other clans for an entire year until this ceremony repeated itself. And so the, st the stone dwellings of Orongo, which are located very precariously between the cliff face and the caldera of the of, uh, of Ranocao, the volcanic crater you see, uh, these houses would be repaired or rebuilt as needed every year as part of the ceremony. They weren't dwellings that were occupied uh, except for this ceremonial period. Um, the petroglyphs of Matangarahu that you can see in some of the pictures here, particularly the one in the on the left. Um, these petroglyphs and the cave paintings at Anakai Tangata, a nearby cave, they all record this ritual, the, the, the Birdman ritual. Um, and all of this obviously is threatened by cliff erosion with evidence of some boulder loss over the years. The site is, this is the site of our main, uh, our project currently, the World Monuments Funds project. I'm not gonna go into details about that, but reflect on the actual significance. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, we can see a video, give a better context of the site. Um, so while this happens, uh, what makes these sites truly special, I think, is their role in the living culture of the Rapa Nui people. For us outsiders, Rapa Nui is an open air museum. The, you know, it's archeological wonders. It captivates our interests, our imagination, so much so that the island receives over a 100,000 visitors per year. This was pre COVID and it's slowly ramping up to that again. 
Um, the historic and artistic and also socioeconomic significance of these sites uh, can be quite clear to many of us. But for the Rapa Nui, significance is really encapsulated in the concept of Ono Tupuna, which, which represents the interconnectedness of heritage in all its forms. So the relationship with the natural, the cultural, the tangible, intangible, it's all considered one. The ancestral knowledge, the traditions, the land, that for the Rapa Nui, they cannot be viewed as separate typologies. And, and this is a sentiment that is also present throughout Polynesia. And, and for the Onutupuna, the guiding principles for this are the mana and tapu. Mana being the spiritual force or power that is believed to reside in people, objects, and the environment. And tapu referring to the cultural protocols or codes of contact, conduct, codes of conduct and engagement that when adhered to are meant to enhance the mana of the place and the Onotubuna. And so for many Rapa Nui, the loss of these heritage sites is akin to losing a family member or even themselves as a culture. Um, when, when we as outsiders or heritage experts coming from the outside in, and when we're developing conservation methodologies, or even when we visit these sites as tourists, it can be incredibly challenging to fully recognize this profound level of significance and connection. It's not as a, as a precious object, but this is a living heritage of the Rapa Nui. And so for us in, in, in the field, I think it's imperative that as we develop more, more, more activities at these sites, we really consider these, these different layers of a dynamic, very dynamic culture and significance. So that's it for me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very, very much indeed, Stephanie, for that, especially with that lovely video at the end. Give us a really, uh, really amazing perspective. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's do that. And let's, let's move straight on to Peter Cox. So, Peter, if you're ready, again, slightly a different view now, zooming out a little bit to uh, look at Icomos. So, Peter Cox is a material scientist with over 40 years experience in the heritage sector and founded Carry Conservation International in 1994. He's a past president of Vicomos Island and the International Scientific Committee on Energy and Sustainability. He's also an active member of the ICOMOS work group on climate change and heritage and of the Climate Heritage Network. So, Peter, welcome. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Um, good, and thank you for the invitation. And <clears throat> I'm going to try and whiz through a number of things. Uh, if we could have the next slide. Um, it's uh, really looking at, at the understanding how climate change uh, impacts on coastal heritage, but also on its significance. Um, these are the number of groups that I'm kind of currently involved in. Um, and uh, next slide, please. But ECOMOS itself, ECOMOS International, is an NGO uh, that looks after world heritage. I'm sure most of you know of it. But uh, they have uh, now 31 international scientific committees. And these are the ones I've just listed that would have direct kind of um, correlation with, with uh, coastal and, and obviously energy and sustainability and climate change, uh, risk preparedness, cultural landscapes, Fortifications and military, uh, as we've seen already, a lot of those are on the seaboard for a good purpose. And then places of religion and ritual, and, and that involves an awful lot of burial, early burial grounds, which would also be on, on the coast. Um, of course, Polar Heritage and our International Scientific Committee are producing reports on an ongoing basis of the uh, reduction in, in ice caps and which of course is then a, a direct correlation to, to sea level rise. And <clears throat> we also have a, a group on underwater cultural heritage, which is very important to understand also. And then obviously the work, uh, we have a certain number of work groups as well, and, and one on the SDGs uh, and also on climate change and heritage. And just more recently, ICMOS has um, produced this or, or developed this new idea of preserving legacy, legacies project, which is really early days. Next uh, slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Ireland actually were at the forefront, which is unusual, but uh, 
we in 2019, we uh, the government decided to uh, create a um, a kind of a, a, a <clears throat> well, it, it was um, a, a base document, a framework for looking at what climate change is going to have uh, or what effect it's going to have on various different departmentals within our government. We won, as Carrig, we won the contract to uh, look at and to do the climate change sectoral adaptation plan for the built and archaeological heritage. And as everybody knows, Ireland is an island, so we have a lot of coast. Next, next, please. Um, and then, of course, the IPCC, which ICOMOS is also quite involved in trying to get them to, to really respect heritage and culture um, as, as well as um, kind of frightening everybody. But um, we've already almost reached 1.5 uh, degree incre increase. Um, and <clears throat> we're definitely going to see by 2030 um, upwards of, of two, which is going to have some real major problems. And I think we're only entering a new area, era of, of consequences of climate change. Next, please. <clears throat> um, as the work group on heritage and um, uh, climate change, uh, we were part of about a 20 person group. Uh, international and we wrote this document which is called the future of our pasts um, and it's engaging cultural heritage and climate action and we have different sectors uh, I was involved in the mitigation sector my colleague Kathy Daly was involved involved in the adaptation uh, and <clears throat> and I know Caitlin I think is going to talk later but we do have to recognize uh, loss and damage, and this is becoming a more kind of um, important uh, acknowledgement, if you like. None of us want it, <laughs> but it's happening. Next slide, please. Um, we were also involved in um, the, uh, well, uh, John Day and, and Scott Heron of, of ECOMOS Australia developed this climate vulnerability index, which is a very quick and dirty, if you like, assessment of world heritage sites and the risk of climate change. And we did uh, this with, uh, with many, many people in Orkney. And uh, <clears throat> it, it was an assessment of, of the Orkney world heritage property. Next, please. We were also involved in Adapt Northern Heritage, which was an EU funded project. Uh, and it um, was Ireland, Scotland, Norway, uh, Denmark, I think, Greenland and Iceland. And we looked at projects within each country to, that were going to be at risk. And we concentrated on a, a, a site called Balanch Gelig's Priory, which is on the south very south coast of Ireland and, and exposed to the Atlantic. Uh, and we, we reckon actually this is probably going to be underwater archeology span by 2016. Uh, next, please. Um, our great world heritage site, um, and the second slide came up a bit too quickly, but anyway, <laughs> thank you, Kira. <laughs> um, but we're doing a climate risk assessment. This is Gaelic Michael. Unfortunately, a lot of the younger um, kind of uh, participants here might recognize it from Star Wars or something, which please don't get me going on that one. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a sixth century monastic settlement, which uh, we just do not, uh, you know, know how they went about this or why, in fact. And then actually in the 11th century, the same monk, or the monks that from this island moved on to the mainland and created the Balanch Gelics that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the, 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 uh, the <clears throat> monastery at the very top of, the, of this rock out in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and it's we call it beehives, and they built them out of local stone, and they amazingly um, are are in reasonably good condition. What we're monitoring at the moment is the increased rainfall, increased wind, and uh, possible subsidence and rockfall 
that could damage. Now, the monastery itself isn't actually really at risk, um, but it's um, it's how you get there and how you climb up these 698 steps uh, to get to it um, that is at risk of rock fall, etc. Next, please. Still about a minute left. Please. Okay. Uh, climate risk assessment also in early uh, six early Christian coastal graveyards. Next slide, please. And here you can see this grave uh, grave was moved by a wave, uh, almost three meters, um, which is pretty phenomenal. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> we uh, also did a, a climate risk assessment of heritage, which in the state of Victoria in, Aus in Australia. Uh, and this is um, <clears throat> a, a park, uh, a kind of um, water park and, and, and heritage site. Yes, a lot younger than what we're used to. Uh, next slide. And the, the, these were the 12 apostles, as they were called, where there's only 10 now. Um, so they're, they're, they're going. Um, next slide, please. And then just to mention that the sustainable development goals, I mean, they, they, yes, 13 is on, on climate action, but so many other SDGs uh, also are relevant to this. Next slide, please. So that's me. Thank you very much. I'm Peter Cox, and there's my contacts. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. That was really, uh, really very interesting. Now, I wonder, do we have Roy back with us just as a... Uh, another attempt. Hello, Alex. Um, yes, here I, he is. Excellent. I, yeah, I, I've had to revert to using my phone. Um, my 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 personal computer is having an existential crisis now, as well as first castles. So my apologies. <laughs> for that. Okay, look in, inside those cases. Mate, I have to be very brief now. Um, they, they were designed to hold very big guns, and I suppose the point I would make about these casemates is that the case and the equipment and the building an integrated machine and that in order to understand how this was all supposed to work um, together you, you have to really follow the evidence of the building and one of the things which is, has come to light in research at Hearst particularly is that you know things were changing year by year and in order to really follow that um, that story of innovative technology um, one has to look at the physical evidence. It's not always um, um, recoverable from documentary evidence. It's the physical evidence, uh, which um, really is of prime importance here. And that, that, that's why the embodied significance of Hearst Castle is so important. If we go on to the next slide, I will just say that very rapidly, um, the casemates at Hearst Castle are the the largest of their kind, the longest of their kind. So in terms of superlatives, uh, Hearst Castle is big and important, size matters, it has unique features uh, as well. If we go on to the next slide, um, I should point out that um, despite the fact that the government spent a huge amount of money at Hearst in the 1860s, by about 30 years uh, later, the defences were hopelessly outdated. Is what we find in a series of further adaptations at Hearst. Now, these are adaptations to provide rounds for quick firing guns. And then the next slide, show you that by the, uh, the Second World War, they're having to update the defenses again. Now, streaming ahead to the next slide, I'm conscious that I need to qu finish quickly. What I want to stress is that one of the reasons why Hearst is so important uh, as a British site is because it, um, it presents a unique snapshot of development of coastal defense in this country. Um, it's the sort of place where you can see the development of artillery defense and garrison life from 1540 to 1940, and that's very rare. The next slide along though, will show you something which I you know, wanted to talk about, but you know, have run out of time. And that's the fact that its coastal location, its dramatic location within the landscape, within the seascape, is something which um, you know you have to stand there to, to, to imagine this. And in fact, let's forget the slides I put in. If you go right to the very last slide, Amkara, uh, and uh, then hopefully we can bring things to, to, to a close. The very last one. There we go. 
there you get a sense of its landscape setting, this sort of liminal position it enjoys betwixt the land uh, and the sea. And you can also see here very clearly that for people who live in this area, the castle is an ever-present um, feature. And for anybody sailing through here, uh, sailing through here historically and from the 16th century through to the 21st century in cruise ships, it's the last of England in a sense. It's a sight they'll see as they're leaving the country. So I'll wrap up there. Abbott. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. I'm so pleased as well you're able to rejoin us. That's, that's excellent. And so look, let's move swiftly on. And we're going to have a, a very different tack again, looking at these different perspectives of significance. Um, and that's you know, excellent to, to arrive at where we are now, thinking then with, uh, with Tom Colwell about the economic aspect of significance. So just to introduce you to Tom, um, he's Senior Economist at Historic England, and working primarily on the Cultural Heritage Capital Program. That's a project run by DCMS, that's the Department for Culture, Media, and Sport in the UK, aiming to better articulate the value of cultural heritage and produce His Majesty's Treasury Supplementary Guidance for the Green Book. Thomas's other work include looking at the impact of culture on voting behaviours and local economic development. But uh, today, Tom is going to focus on contested values and heritage. So welcome, and uh, hopefully, you're able to join us and tune in. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be discussing some of the work that Historic England have been doing to understand both the economic and statistical significance. So I'm used to caveating things. So when we when we discuss these things, we sit in a very small team within Historic England, um, traditionally about two people. Um, out of an organization that's pretty big and has lots of other expertise. So when we when we discuss some of these kind of different topics, uh, it's not to work in a different direction or to it's to to work in conjunction with our, the rest of our colleagues. Um, if we go on to the next uh, slide, please. So we did a study on Belsey Hall, um, wanted to understand what if we could estimate the cultural and economic value of the site for things that traditionally aren't measured by the market. So that is the non-use value and um, and stuff like that. Uh, next slide. Um, so the site was Bellsey Hall. It's a grade one listed building near Newcastle. It's just slightly different. We're not talking about coastal, unfortunately. We haven't been able to apply that method to this one. Um, but it's a grade one listed building um, situated just between England and Scotland. If we go on to the next slide. Um, I've put this here. Uh, this is just some readings, but um, it's just to show the, the different types of uh, uh, literature that, that has utilised some of these methods that we're talking about. So it's not just restricted to cultural heritage. It's, it could be all sorts of things. It can be to do with festivals. It can be do, do with uh, maritime heritage. And I think for the point of this study is that these type of methods could be applied to coastal heritage as well. Um, but I think the best way to describe how these choice experiments work is with an example. So if we go to the next slide. So essentially what we do is we we have a choice set and we, we ask a series of different options and we repeat this lots of times. Um, so we ask random people of the population. Uh, in this example, we looked at both visitors and non-visitors. And we ask them what would their preferred option be? So they pick in this choice set option one, option two, or option three. You'll notice they all have different price tags applied to them. They have different levels of attributes that might um, constitute to different services or conservation. Um, and we, we ask this repeatedly um, to the same person, I think about six or seven times. And then we ask it to a lot of people. So we aim for about 200 visitors and about 200 uh, non-visitors. And by doing this, we can uh, elicitate people's preferences towards each one of those attributes and, and more. Um, cool, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just some details of how the, the when the survey was conducted. Um, I just said about 200 visitors and non-visitors. If we, we can probably pass on to the next one in the interest of time. Um, and they were asked a series of questions. So we, we wanted to firstly understand some of their background info. So we've, we supplied some background info on, on Belsey Hall. We then asked some socio-demographic questions so that we can understand how different people will answer these. Then we do some very crazy maths and statistical analysis. And we ask some questions towards their attitudes towards heritage. Um, next slide. So moving on to the results now. Uh, next slide, sorry. 
Um, so this table here, I think if you can click one more. Uh, oh, maybe not. Go back, sorry. <laughs> I think some of the uh, animations have gone. So this table here, uh, and it looks even worse without some of the animations. It's quite a scary looking table. Um, but what it what it what it's showing us is uh, how we see significance and magnitude in in economics. And the one thing I really want to kind of point point the eyes to is the little stars that accompany next to the numbers. And these are measures of significance for, for us. And what we've done here is we've asked these series of questions and we want to understand how sure are we that people would pay to, to see to get these improvements. So in this example, we have conservation options, we have new new services and for culture and, and education opportunities. And we also have a fence to socialize with, with other visitors aimed at towards adults. Um, and what we did is we asked this both to the visitors and non-visitors, and we do some maths to go along with it. And we can measure how sure we are that people would actively pay for this. And what those stars indicate is how sure we are. So the one, most of them all have three stars. And that is to say that we are sure that people would be willing to pay for conservation to the hall or conservation to the call and castle. And that we we're sure that if we repeated this test over a thousand times, we these this wouldn't happen by chance. So we we we're understanding the public preferences towards this. And then the size of those numbers is kind of indicating how much people would be willing to pay for that. But if we go on to the next slide, we can convert that. Oh no, we just got one of if we go to the following slide, just the keep me. So we can then convert that into willingness to pay for for these um attributes. Now, a really interesting thing here is we see that non-visitors have a high willingness to pay for conservation for services and new facilities towards this heritage site. What you do notice is that while the numbers are larger, we're not as confident. So if you look at the brackets figures, there are our, our confidence intervals. And we're saying what we see is a lot, far larger gap. And that's because a lot of non-visitors might say, I'm not going to pay anything for this site. Uh, but a lot of them do appreciate that value. And they, they, they appreciate that request and the value to their future generations, and they are happy to pay for it. Um, the other thing just to note here is non-visitors are asked for an increase in their council tax, whereas visitors are asked for an increase in their ticket price. So the direct comparison really should be a bit cautious here. But what we can show here is that with significance and confidence that nearly all of these different services or facilities um, added towards Belsey Hall, there is uh, a public preference to pay for them. And we can use this to make government um, grants uh, uh, in business cases to do cost benefit analysis. And we can start talking the language that perhaps culture her we, we can struggle with when, when we're advocating for culture heritage, because we're talking in the language that um, HMR, Treasury as such, uh, like to talk in. What there is probably to note at the bottom here is that you do see some negative signs. You see with more offence to socialise with other visitors from the local area, in the brackets you see a negative sign. And that is to suggest that we are not confident um, at a significant level, which would be 5%. So that's saying if we ran this 100 times, five more than five people, uh, it might happen by chance more than five times. So we're not significant that we're not we're not sure we're not we're not confident that people would pay for these attributes is the best way to say it. And if we just go on to the next slide, please. About a minute left, Tom. Yeah. Okay. So this is how we could apply these in a cost benefit analysis. Um, these are the figures you've just seen before, but we use the lower bound estimates. And again, it's very important, I think, to talk about those non-users, those non-visitors, and that value they um, attribute to to doing these different um, um, activities. And the importance with that is that when when we go and we're, we're, we're making our decisions on whether uh, we should invest um, our money into different cultural sites or different, different sorry, I've lost my lighting in the room, um, different uh, other government options that with that non-use value, we, we understand the value, that value better. Um, if we go to the next slide, sorry, I'm trying to rush through. Um, this is just indicating some different attributes here. So 
for instance, we see that people with children are less likely to, to want to pay for conservation. And there's some interesting snippets there, but there's no point in going in detail. And if we skip through all the way to the end, and just look at the conclusion. Uh, the one more slide, I think. Oh, we've lost some of our animations again. But basically what we've we found is that people would significant, uh, uh, significantly uh, willing to pay for, for conservation, for new educational experiences and new offense to socialize with children, uh, with, see, with adults. And we, we can utilize that in our kind of traditional economic framework and advocate for the protection of um, cultural heritage. Excellent. Um, Brilliant, thank you. And there is another person who worked on this called Brenda, and I, I'm not sure why her email is not appearing there, but um, if you do want to contact, it's either me or, or her. Great, we'll sort that out. Thanks very much indeed, Tom, that's brilliant. And uh, just a reminder that if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll have uh, time for a couple at the end of uh, the speakers. So thank you very much, Tom, that's fantastic. And so finally then, we'll move to Caitlin de Silvi, and uh, Professor de Silvi is Professor of Cultural Geography at the University of Exeter. She's a geographer, like me, which is good, whose research explores the cultural significance of change and transformation, with a particular focus on heritage and ecologies and climate futures. And uh, we're really looking forward to what you have to say, Caitlin. So hopefully you uh, can be able to tune in. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, thank you. All right, thanks for the opportunity to be with you all from all over the world. It's very exciting having an audience that is dispersed in this way. Um, I've kept to my brief <laughs> around significance and coastal heritage, um, and I've decided to to start with a place because I'm a geographer, but I um most of my thinking arises from talking to people in places. So if I could just have the next slide, I'm going to tell you where we're beginning on another shingle spit, as it happens. This on the other side of the bulge of Britain. Um, this is Orford Ness. And you can see here that long finger is um, to vegetated shingle spit, which has an amazing history, um, quite different from the spit that Hearst is on. It um, is tangled up with sort of Cold War um, research and also has really uh, quite profound nature significance. So it was purchased by the National Trust in 1993 and is now a National Nature Reserve and managed by the Trust. Um, and it's a significant place for, for many reasons, but one of the reasons I'm interested in it is because it's actually a place where it, its significance has changed over time and where change actually has produced new significance, which is what I'm gonna talk about. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so I started working at Orchard Nests, I think over 12 years ago now, um, and I was particularly interested in the way that they were working with uh, change in relation to some of the features from the um, Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. And so this is not direct, it's, it, it's coastal and it's significant that it's coastal, but I was more interested in how they were managing ruination in relation to some of these structures. And I think it helped, this place helped me think about how actually the dynamism of these places actually was generating engagement and generating new values in relation to the aesthetics and the ecologies of these spaces. Um, next slide. I then went on um, to work at Orford Ness um, as part of a big project called Heritage Futures that was led by Rodney Harrison um, at UCL. And sorry, I, I've, I've overlinked you. <laughs> There's tons of stuff that I gave to Kara. So all the stuff I'm talking about, you can find. Um, yeah, so for Heritage Futures, we worked with an amazing group of people um, as part of the Citizen project. And here, particularly, we were working with coastal heritage, archaeological heritage, which was being exposed by the dynamic movement of this coastline. Um, and this was really re uh, significant in the sense that here, what was valuable was actually the way that change was revealing new features. Um, next slide. So one of the features that we um, they were working on when we were doing the project was a, an old police tower. Um, here you can see the sh ridges of the vegetated shingle spit, but um, what was interesting here was that they were finding remnants of the base of the old police tower, stitching together a history. They were finding value through change and transformation that had not been legible before. So actually, in some ways, the vulnerability created an opportunity for people to engage with that history in a way that wasn't available to them before. Um, so next slide. Um, 
Orford Nest was the place where we went on to see the project, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of this. Um, we had a workshop in 2018 called Transforming Loss. Next slide. And on the back of that, we put together a bid for the Landscape Decisions Project, where we got together a really diverse team of heritage practitioners and academics to really think about um, how you could integrate thinking about natural and cultural heritage in dynamic and transformative heritage landscapes. So places where change is happening, and that's the baseline, and trying to understand how we could manage those in ways where you might see what looks like loss as something that's actually an opportunity to work with transformation and think about significance in a different way. Next slide. Um, so we developed a, a sort of mad idea, but we did we did work with a lot of different people to come up with this. And I sometimes think I'm going to look back on this as like a mad COVID moment where we had people's attention to just really think outside the box. Um, but the idea that we came up with was um, sort of as an alternative to thinking about managed decline. Um, we defined it as adaptive release. And I'm just going to go through. It's a bit animated. Yeah. So the idea here is that we're talking about places. You could stop with the animations for a second. <laughs> Talking about places where the traditional conservation options are not available, right? So this is not about trying to manage change in a it, it sort of accelerate change in any way. It's more about recognizing places where erosion, sea level rise, all these things are going to cause some kind of pretty radical landscape change or erosion of um, integrity in relation to an asset. So it's saying, well, what if we just work with that and we just accept that it's not loss, it's not letting go, it's actually releasing this place. And while we watch that happen, we can do these things. So if we could go to the next animation. So if we, what happens if we commit to monitor and learn from that change in transformation, like those archeologists on the coast. Next, um, if we try to identify and interpret emergent significance, so both natural and cultural significance and how they might be related, next. And then how working with people, so local communities, really important. How can we provide opportunities for people to engage with that process? So what might look like loss actually becomes an opportunity for engaging people with learning more about the history of these places, learning more about the ecologies that might be emerging. Um, next. Yeah, and then also recognizing that sometimes you might go back. You might choose adaptive release and then realize that you have resources to actually shift and go back to those standard options at the top. Uh, next slide. Right. Okay. So the significance piece, I mean, I think there's a lot of words on here, but I think this is from a research report that we did with Historic England, where we were really trying to be clear that what we're talking about is to the continuum with other conservation approaches. So we have adaptive reuse. We have what does adaptive release look like? You know, how can we work with transformation? And there's an animation here. You can just click, Kara. <laughs> Just flagging, I don't, they're not coming through very well. Oh, sorry, back. Um, the important thing is that we're talking about identifying potential for integrated natural and historic environment benefits. And in historic England at the moment, this conversation is going into their culture and heritage capital stuff. It's like sort of the big ecosystem services language. You know, how can we actually think about this place in a, in a way that the transformation generates these new benefits or contributions? Next. Yeah, and I think just to, to be, this is my, you know, wonky significance slide, but I think it might be useful. Um, in the UK context, the significance is a funny one, you know, um, in that it's defined in one way in conservation principles in a quite broad way around the sum of cultural and natural heritage values. Um, and then in the actually the planning policy framework that guides how decisions get made, it's defined in a much narrower way. Um, and so this is an issue, and I think policy and legislation are issues in, in this space. If you could just go to the next slide, I'm almost done. Oh, yeah, that was just pointing out the two points, the cultural and natural, and then the architectural historic. I mean, I think my, my final point is here is that adaptive release is an idea that we came up with to throw into the mix in case it's useful for people to to start to, to play with it, to see if it might work. I think what's really key here is that in many places, we're talking about a partial <laughs> treatment in line with adaptive release. So we're not talking about total release. And I think that's some way in which this is often misunderstood is like that it's somehow this wholesale non-intervention. I think um, I did talk to John and Alex before, and I think what's it's really important to recognize, this is another point from the um, research report, that we're talking about um, something that hasn't been tested yet. And so if there is an interest in testing in some way, We'd be very open to having conversations with people who are managing sites where you have these issues and you are interested in navigating some of this stuff. But um, I think that that is me. If we go to the next, yeah, and so you have the links. Um, 
and hopefully there'll be an opportunity to pick some of this up in the future. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed, Ken, for very, another very, very stimulating presentation. And it's really nice to have this real breadth that we've seen um, today of all of these different perspectives and different approaches. I know that uh, in terms of time, we are far up against, I think we just want to squeeze in maybe one question like I see in the chat there. Uh, we will see if any more come up, but we're really quite up to time. I'll just, just read this one from Mariana Pereira. So thank you very much indeed. I, uh, I was wondering, how has local knowledge from coastal communities of dealing with waterscapes been used in the management of these sites and towards climate action? So I wonder if any of our panelists want to pick up on that. I should just say very quickly that Coastal Connections, the series of seminars, uh, as we'll find out a little bit later, the, the next one in the series deals with sustainable engineering solutions, which includes nature-based solutions, rather interesting. So for those of you that are interested in that, obviously, if you all of you, please turn up next time, that's the 20th of February. Um, but if any of our panelists want to, any of our speakers want to address that particular point. So how has local knowledge from coastal communities of dealing with waterscapes been used in the management of these sites and towards climate action, anything? I, I'm trying to find a, um, a hand, but I'm not sure I can, Alex, because I'm on the phone oh, uh, doing this. Good. Apologies. I mean, I, can I can I just say that that was a really fascinating array of speakers there, and I think that coming back to why are we focusing on significance, is because um, we really need to find ways of speaking the same sort of language. Now, I think there are recognised there are different approaches and different values out there. You know, in the West and the UK, we've got a very specific, structured way of trying to analyse what significant means to. But I heard from Stephanie, the Rapid New has taken a totally different approach to understanding significance. And that's what I think would really be great to capture in all these exercises to think about how do we, how do different places and cultures and institutions value significance differently and for what purpose? And I think if we better understand that and we can think of that bigger picture of how do we go to around you know, providing support and advice to sites as we recognise that there are there are different, very, sometimes very different and nuanced approaches to significance. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. That's, that's really helpful to understand that breadth. And I think uh, to be reminded of that, again, just, just to answer really quickly about the question that was posed later, there are, of course, the, uh, the new mangroves, uh, mangrove forest has been planted in, in Hill in Tanzania in terms of local solutions curbing the rate of coastal erosion. That's one of the uh, uh, sort of well-known case studies. And we're hoping to find more case studies through this whole process. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the watch and I think we ought to perhaps move on to our discussion now. So I want to pass on to John uh, Darlington, my colleague here at WMF Britain, to launch into that. And that's where we get a chance to really talk about some of the things we've been listen about so over to you john well, thank you alex that's that's very helpful so we've had we've had about 100 people attend many of you are practitioners you look after sites monuments landscapes and have a particular interest in what is the impact of climate change on those places particularly coastal climate change in the future but there's also going to be others of you who are just generally interested and might have a local site or landscape on your doorstep and want to know what are the you know, what, what are the issues surrounding it. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to send you all to five little breakout rooms. So all you need to do is click on the button when you see it. You'll go to a breakout room and what we want you to do and how much you participate is totally up to you. We want you just to uh, just, just perhaps pick out a few key takeaways from what you've heard today. So if you're a manager of a site, does it have resonance for you? Are there particular challenges in some of the approaches that you've heard? Uh, and if you're someone who's interested in a place of interest to you, you know, how, does, how does this reflect on your thinking and what the future of that site is? So it's a really simple question. As I say, we'll send you to 10, uh, sorry, five breakout rooms the one thing I'd ask is if the first thing you do, can you can you elect someone to report back? It's not onerous. We just want someone to summarise your conversations and we'll come back in approximately 10 minutes time just to round off this. The whole idea for us is trying to capture as much information about what's happening out there so that we can then share that internationally. So with that, Kira, hopefully I've spoken, given you enough time 
to actually allocate people to rooms and we'll see you in 10 minutes time. Wonderful, I can see people coming back in. Uh, I hope your conversations were good. We haven't got a huge amount of time to feed back actually. Uh, so I'm gonna perhaps ask if anyone wants to feedback kind of a couple of key things from whichever group you were in. Uh, we had a really good discussion where we covered funding, we recovered, we covered uh, the value of heritage beyond the heritage community and how heritage or archaeology already tells the, the, the story of past climate change. Uh, and we can go into some detail on that but if we had time, but we don't. So I'm just quickly asking, is there anyone else who would like to do a little bit of feedback on your discussion in, in one of your breakout rooms? Hannah, I think you've raised your hand. Thank you, Hannah. You're on mute, Hannah. So we've got Hannah and Juan. So Kira, if you can unmute uh, Hannah and then Juan, that'd be great. So we're, we're having a challenging day with the technology. This is the first one. You should be, anyone who's got a question, you should be able to unmute yourselves, but just send me a message in the chat if you're having issues. Juan, I think you're you're now um, off mute. Yes, may I speak? You may. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes, this is a wonderful uh, a, a opportunity to see what's happening around the world in this, this universal problem with sea level rise and all of that. Um, my, my direct connection is I'm a, an architectural historian and I've worked a lot on the fortifications of San Juan. And this issue comes to mind in a very uh, evident way in regard to the Castillo del Morro, which is like the, the vis visage of Puerto Rico in many ways. And the fortress sat on a reef on the coast that was, that was an integral part of its personality and character. Recently, misguided efforts to preserve it have constructed this mole around the base that has virtually destroyed the image of, of the place. And even though it was done with the best of intentions, possibly, I have my suspicions, uh, it really highlights the need to integrate whatever measures are taken in terms of protecting the shoreline uh, into the, 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 the character and, and, and uh, uh, a, personality of the site in question, at least say one destroy the other. I think this is an issue that came up with that site in Britain, uh, Hearst Castle, where there, a mole was constructed around the edge of it and it virtually uh, it, it obliterated the vista of the place. Uh, it, I think it would be good to, to embrace that problem uh, wholesale and, uh, on a world scale because it is a major problem. You know, preserving a, pro a site should not, not it implicitly lead to its destruction through preservation. So that's the comment I'd like to make in regards to that. Thank, Thank you very much. much. That's, that's been very helpful. Uh, and so perhaps we can ask for you, uh, perhaps it'd be good to kind of continue this conversation with your details to kind of think about how it fits into coastal connections. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob, uh, well, if you think that the, the the barrier that we put up around Hearst Castle, around the temporary defences, now is bad, you should see what the designers came up with with a permanent defence <laughs> all the way around the castle. £100 million pounds worth of rock armour, which we'll never be able to afford, and would dramatically change the aesthetics of the, of the castle itself. So, you know, we recognise that that change can be complex, and sometimes change has to happen because you need to stop collapse and things happening and sometimes you as john said you have to make informed choices about how you do things but that understanding of value which is which is what we're talking about here and, and relates to aesthetics it relates to context and set uh, is is really really important thank you rob uh i'm very conscious that we're running out of time i think it's been really useful in helping us to frame the next conversation so we can get the timings right and the technology right on that. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to be quiet now and hand over the final word to Alex. Alex, over to you. Great. Thanks, John. And thanks everyone for taking part. I mean, one of the, the real benefits of bringing people together from all over the world is 
that you can share within those discussion groups and some of your own experiences. And we really very much want to see more of that and just to perhaps direct your attention a little bit more to the series of workshops we've got planned. And you see here the slide that uh, Kira's put up, we're dealing with lots of different aspects. And this has been a program that's been developed with managers of science, of coastal heritage science. So in the conversations that we've been having, for example, to find out what are those key issues that people want to find out more about and to, well, really to swap and exchange stories and, uh, and experiences. And so I would say very much so that if, for example, you have, you come from a site that perhaps you manage and maybe it's one of those sites particularly that perhaps we haven't heard about. You, you, you go on about hearing more and more case studies from places that, uh, that aren't usually known. And if that's you, then please do get in touch because it is critically important to, I think, how we face these challenges together going forward that we share knowledge, share expertise, and share that experience from whatever site it is that you come from, whether it's a small coastal heritage site or a larger one that may be well known or not so well known. So please do get in touch. Next time, and I say next time that will be on the 20th of February, we'll be looking at sustainable engineering solutions. And again, we'll be hearing from some examples and then having a discussion about those. After that, the following month we'll be dealing with communities and intergenerational stewardship. And again, you can see how that program is going to work. But I'll encourage you please to get in touch again if you have something you want to share in terms of being a speaker perhaps or participating, we'd love to hear from you. And just a, a final note really as well before I thank the speakers and everyone who's taken part, please do bear in mind that there's also a survey which you can fill in that takes about 15 minutes to complete particularly, but not exclusively, particularly if you manage a coastal heritage site, we would really like to hear from you via that survey so we can tailor coastal connections and what we offer much more closely. And, and so really anyone who is here who wants to participate and take this further and shape these workshops, uh, we really would be really very grateful if you would fill out that survey for us and see that there is a link in the chat where you can do that and uh, hopefully some more, yes, John's put his hand up, John. John just back. one very yes. quick thing uh, before Alex says the final thank yous, and that is part of the idea of these workshops is that we're asking all the participants to kind of summarise what they've spoken about over a couple of pages, which we can then put out as a PDF. So if you want to dive deeper into those, this is going to be one of the things that we're going to hopefully produce, literally a whole series of PDF documents which describe the particular examples from across the world where people are actually doing something uh, related to climate change and coastal heritage. Alex, I interrupted you. No, no thanks very much indeed for the reminder. It's good to, good to know that as well. That will be a resource that we'll offer and develop over time too. So just then, Lane's asked me to thank everyone who's taken part today, but particularly the speakers who've taking the time to be really, uh, really succinct and how they've got their message across and digging with us and helping us to uh, to make sure this has been a really fun and beneficial workshop despite this technology that we've had. So thank you to all, and thank you particularly to the speakers and to Kira to uh, who's been supporting us as well. That's been fantastic. So have a great rest of the day and uh, we'll see you next time. Look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much.